in this exercise, you're going to be creating a bubble diagram and a party or block diagram. You're also going to be developing your concept based on the information that you've gathered about the client and the project during programming. I've given examples about how to complete your assignment. You may do much of the same for your own personal project. Since this isn't a space planning class and we only have one day to do this, um, I show you what solutions I came up with when working with the actual client. You may basic, keep the basic um, design that I had or you can modify it. That's up to you. And I'm just going to go over the thought process and then I'm going to ask you to generate your own versions so that you have practice and experience of the process. So we begin with bubble diagrams. And bubble diagrams basically take what the information about the project and what your clients were requesting about the project and it puts it into a visual um, diagram. It's rough, it's a, it's a type of conceptual thinking, but we're visual people. And so I I've had you highlight kind of key points. I've had you put in and ask more questions about the project. And what you're going to do is you're going to, going to create something like this that takes all of that notes that you've gathered through interviewing and research and put it into some sort of flat 2D, most often called a bubble diagram. Now here is very loose. Example, this is not your actual project, but you can see that they begin to think about the site. So to think about the site, um, we also think about where the major views are. So accordingly, if the major view was here, let's say this is north, um, if it was here, then you're going to want to think about how you want to place the home on the site to maximize the views. So in this example, you can see the back of the house, the main living area, the outdoor patio area, the study, and the master bedroom all maximize the outdoor view. It makes sense that the garage would be more at the front of the house or perhaps protect or guard against unsightly views, right, rather than placing the garage at the back of the house. You begin to think about the spaces that your clients need and how they will move through the house, through the entry, uh, what views you would like the, you know, the, the uh, clients uh, to, to maximize, to utilize, um, what area of the house are public spaces versus private spaces. So public spaces, living areas, perhaps studies. Studies can be both private or public areas. The kitchen is typically a public area of the house. Game rooms are public areas of the house. And how do those relate to each other? Versus, let's say, a private wing or area of the house that wants to be separated by maybe a hallway or an atrium or something. So master bedrooms or owner's retreats. We're trying to get away from the word masters, so help me with that. Owner's retreat and you know what areas um, need to be adjacent to each other. So these are things that we try to take from the programming and put into some sort of diagram. Bubble diagrams also help us with space allocations. Clearly different spaces require different square footage. Square footage is, square footage is calculated by um, typical in a square room length times width. So if it was a 10 foot by 10 foot room, it would be 100 square feet. When you're working with your bubble diagrams, consider these space allocations. For example, a small powder room, laundry area, smaller bathroom would require a smaller square footage and therefore a smaller bubble than the great room or the owner's retreat. So as you're creating your bubble diagrams, you're going to want to allocate different sizes of the bubbles to represent the different sizes of the space. Next, you'll begin to think about, as you create your bubbles, 
which spaces should be adjacent to one another. So when you are creating your bubble diagram, you can create them two ways. You can do separated adjacencies or interlocking adjacencies. In this example, the designer is proposing that the entryway as you walk in, probably through a hallway, should be adjacent to the living room and dining room area. So this is a very traditional way of organizing a home. My home is organized this way, where you walk into the main entryway, and on one side is your living area and your formal dining area. This is more of a traditional way of laying out a home. You can also represent that by not just separating those, but actually joining them or interlocking them. I tend to prefer the separated adjacencies and then I put little dots or arrows next to them and you'll see some of the examples of my work. Next you're going to want to think about circulation patterns. So if you're starting with the entry to the home, how does one circulate through the space? You're going to be representing those within your bubble diagram. And some circulations are primary while others are secondary. And you're going to make different types of marks to indicate which are those. So maybe dashed is primary and solid is secondary. And what do I mean by that? I mean that some circulation patterns are used over and over again. Those are primary circulation patterns. For example, from the front door to the great room. That's a, I mean, that's probably going to happen daily. Or from the garage through the laundry room to the great room. Or from the great, from the kitchen to the great room. Or from the kitchen to the dining room. Those are major primary traffic patterns. And then there's some secondary traffic patterns as well. So you need to think about those. And this, when you identify these, this will help you with space planning later and furniture planning later once you've identified the major traffic patterns of the space. You also want to include view indicators. So there are going to be on most projects um, pr views that would be preferred uh, by the client and by the designer. Um, Many designers, I just spoke to one who graduated um, from Phoenix and Scottsdale Community College and now has her own design firm. Uh, she gets to go out to Sedona and to Desert Highlands and actually look at the site. Sometimes you even help your clients pick the site or the plot or of land that they would like to build their home. And you decide, you know, what is the maximized view and how do you want the, the home to sit on the site? So it's nice to put in your bubble diagrams, you know, where the view is, maybe where you have a unsightly view, such as maybe you look into your neighbor's yard, or maybe there's a grade change, or, you know, sometimes in great neighborhoods, I've, I've seen great Camelot homes where, you know, they're close to a dump, and you probably don't want to see the dump, but rather the, or the pit that used to be a dump, uh, but rather you want to see the view of the city or the view of the desert. You should create a simple legend um, that uh, indicate what your marks represent. Now this is up to the designer. Um, I mean, some, you can do a view with, with kind of that looks like a pool with arrows. Sometimes I put a view and I put a smiley face or I, if it's the desert maybe or if it's the ocean or a lake, maybe you do that. Um, so you can decide what your um, indicators look like but you should also create a legend so that you know that dash lines represent primary traffic flow, dots represent secondary, dash lines are service, and then this is what your view is. So you should include on your bubble diagram a legend. Here is an example of uh, one designer's, I thought it was very nice, uh, bubble diagram. So here you can see that there is primary uh, circulation. So from the courtyard through the courtyard, you walk into the foyer. So these are separated bubbles, and that's how I typically do that. And so primary traffic through the courtyard to the foyer to the living room, probably to the dining room, through the hallway. So you can see this close circulation patterns. And then second circulation patterns here in yellow. Utility and dashed. 
And then look at this, this lucky client has views from the kitchen, living room, owner's re-suite, master bath, and a view out in front as well from the guest bedroom and a view from the dining area. So kind of nice, nice views on both sides. One thing I would like you to include also that I don't see in this example is an indicator of north arrow. So north arrow, typically you have your home. Um, typically in general plans, you houses are facing north. But because this is a custom design class, our, our home can be situated on any um, direction on the lot. So here in Arizona, we really want to think about north, south, east, and west. Northern exposure is nice. Um, uh, uh, Eastern, okay, uh, good as well. Southern, really nice. Um, but that Western exposure, um, very harsh here in Phoenix, Arizona, or Cave Creek, Arizona, where you're going to have your project. So for example, if this was Western exposure, and this is how you were chosen, choosing to, to lay out your home on the site, um, this would be an awful experience. I will just tell you that I've actually had the home up on the hill before the recession with the main living area, the kitchen, and my master bedroom all facing west. Gorgeous view, you know, before times got a little tough. Gorgeous view and everything, but I could, there was nothing I can do to shade that from the harsh western exposure. So I would have had to do deep, deep overhangs because film on the windows, trees, all those kind of things just weren't helping. Here's just a colored example. So this is just a different way of communicating um, your bubbles. So your bubbles can be created um, with gray markers, with a little bit of color, or you can do a color area. So if you would like to do that. In the in-person class, I will go over how to create your bubbles. But for those of you who are online or just listening today, um, trick and tip. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> trick and tip. If you're using a template, you can also do these freehands, but if you're using these templates, go ahead, and put your template down, and put in your marker first. Let that dry and then write in the text, and then go back in with the, te with the template and do your outline. So these look more freehand, which I like as well, but if you're using a template, for any case, it's often easier to pl put down your marker first. From the experience and information that you've gained from a di bubble diagram, um, you can then begin to grid scale right? You can actually start putting in your square footage and you can actually start having this early example of what the floor plan is going to look like directly from your bubble diagram. So I know that um, a lot of students now don't use uh, marker. Um, in the past I used to use post-it notes on tracing paper to do this. Um, I know that students today actually go from their preliminary bubble diagram and they begin to go directly into AutoCAD and create these blocks in AutoCAD. And, and that is, is perfectly fine um, in this class because we're not going to start AutoCAD uh, until next week. Uh, go ahead and just create that with marker or on PowerPoint. So your turn. First you're going to create your own bubble diagram. In step one, I've, create, I've, I've given you the actual template that you can print out if you don't have your printouts, or you can make uh, use that PowerPoint to make your bubble diagrams uh, in the PowerPoint itself. So here is, is what um, just a little indicator of what the space looked like uh, when it was finished from one of my clients. Uh, that's what it looked like. And what I'm going to ask you to do is place a piece of tracing paper, or use the PowerPoint, place a piece of tracing paper over the drawing, and you're going to trace the perimeter of the floor plan using pen or marker. At this point, of course, you do not add the interior walls. You're looking at the solved solution, and I'm asking you just to go back and go through the process. 
So the first thing you're going to do, uh, I hope in, in person and online, is you're going to trace the perimeter of the space. Now, how do I do that? I typically use a gray marker, a Prismacolor marker, and I use the chiseled edge of the marker to outline the edges. I don't think about windows yet because, you know, windows can be moved and doors can be altered, but I just go in with my marker and I trace the perimeter. And it'll look something like this. So this is what it would look like in PowerPoint. So you begin to see the footprint. And I've left this light design underneath it but if you didn't have that, I mean, I had to go through this process, right? If you didn't have that, you would begin to think, well, entry, garage, you know, what do, what do I want off the garage? Perhaps a laundry room. So that could be here, which actually in the final example um, became a storage space for the garage. But if you want to, you can use that space. So you can use this space, and this could be the laundry room, and maybe this could be a powder bath. Um, then we have two bedrooms. We have a bedroom at the front of the house, and we have a second bedroom here. Now your client wants you to make one of those rooms a office. So you can decide, do I want to make the guest bedroom here and the office at the front of the house, and maybe there's entry for guests from the front of the house, or do I want to make the guest bedroom here, kind of private and away from everybody, and then the office at the side of the house, and maybe there's an entry from the side of the house. So these are things that you're just going to think about and bubble out. Um, I was kind enough to put the final, you know, the final solution under you, uh, but you should go through the thought process. So first thing is to do the footprint. This is what it looks like, a very poor scan, but this is what it might look like with marker. And then you're going to either use the PowerPoint or on Trace, you're going to start putting in your bubbles. And again, we talked about space allocation, you know, a smaller space for the entry, a laundry room, a powder room, an office. And you're going to think about where outdoor living space, you know, maybe you want to make this area bigger and you want to bring the outdoor living space here. Um, so I will let you stay within this this entire area if you wanted to kind of play with this as well. But this is your footprint, so you can't go further out. You can't go this way. Um, you can you know, move this and adjust the entry door, but you need to stay with this general shape. Next, you're going to add the room names. Kitchen, great room, home office, a bath, a foyer, a bedroom, laundry room, powder room, owner's retreat needs a water closet, um, a walk-in closet, it needs uh, a loo, uh, the bathroom, shower, and your owner's retreat. This is an example of what the preliminary might look like quickly with bubbles. And here's an example of adding all some additional information in PowerPoint. So here you're adding the notes that you collected from programming. So very important information. North, south, east, west. Please place those into your final um, bubble diagram that you're presenting. So for example, working as a designer here in Phoenix, Arizona, we typically place the garage and areas that don't need a lot of, you know, storage spaces, laundry rooms, things that don't need a lot of windows, those usually we try to get on the west wall. The south wall, great for, um, in Arizona, a little cooler in the summer, a little warmer in the winter, but no, none of this really kind of harsh direct light. And then east you'll have morning sun, and you might want to think about that, but east is a, is a, a very softer light. Uh, than Western exposure. So please add that, add some um, points that your client requested. And maybe as you're in this page, maybe you're coming up with things yourself. Like 
your client is requesting to add a fireplace in the great room. So maybe I want to put the fireplace here. Maybe I want to put the fireplace here. You know, you're starting to think about, okay, I need to add a fireplace. Maybe during your uh, research on your historical st style, maybe you want to, at the early stages of the design process, you need to tell the architecture that you want to vault, raise the ceiling height, add clear story windows. You would want to get that to the architect as soon as possible if anything, anything needs to be changed to the height of the ceiling or the type of ceiling. So begin to add those notes that you've collected from programming. Add your major and minor adjacency and traffic patterns. Create the symbol and the legend. I used arrows. I inserted arrows here uh, in PowerPoint. And for these, I used a highlighter in PowerPoint. So you can use whatever you want. That's not the point. But the point for you is to do this process and really get you into the feel of the home and an understanding of what your client wants visually. This visually helps you see what the client's needs are and what the home is beginning to morph into and look like so that you can develop further your designs. Here's an example of pen on marker. Again, if you're using a template, place the gray marker first, add in your text, and then trace again with the Sharpie or your Paper Mate Flare on top of that. Then you're going to do your own block diagram after you've created your and completed your final um, diagram solutions. So before here, um, again this isn't a space planning class, we need to move into custom design, but in your space planning class your instructor may ask you or your client may ask you to come up with separate, several ways you know, three or four ways that this house can be laid out. I mean, think about it. You can flip the orientation, or flip, make, you know, the great room on this side and the master bedroom on that side. You can flip north, south, east, west based on preliminary ideas. Uh, you can change the location of the, the master, the home office, ex etc. You can create a formal dining area or make this more part of the kitchen. So there would be several different ideas several different versions of this. This is just what I finalized with the client and I'm going to let you go ahead and keep it pretty much the same. But do know, in practice, you would probably do several of these bubble diagrams before moving to the blocks. Here you can see the room starting to develop. You know, unless you're doing something very organic and sculptural, which you can, uh, you begin with blocked rooms. So most rooms are squared or rectangular versions of the square. But even if you're doing something very organic, I would recommend blocking in the rooms first because then you're going to come in and decide where you want to curve those walls. So it helps to work within the block first. After you've placed your blocks according to the allocation of space, square footage, you can go ahead and put the rooms in. You can start seeing the floor plan starting to take shape. What is a hall, what will become hallway and traffic, what will become rooms. And this is what it would look more like with markers on tracing paper. You could do it either way. And after you're done with your bubble diagram, and then your party diagram or block diagram, you're going to move to creating your concept statement. Here's my concept statement. As you can see from last week, um, I've created my um, collage, my inspiration photo. Um, based on my inspiration photo, I put together a direction that I would like to see the home project go. I've had this approved by the client. From there, I've done my bio, bubble diagram and I've created my general layout and I want to present a concept statement. This is kind of like your um, elevator talk, your quick little, what's, tell me about this project. And so in my concept statement, I'm trying to put a little more romance into it, uh, visual language, a little more fluff. So let me see if I go directly from a problem statement, which is like, they want this, they want that, they're looking for this, to something a little more, I'm going to use the word poetic. 
The Bryce residence is a clean lined masterpiece where glass, wood, and concrete meld into the desert scape. So in that first sentence, I'm talking about how I'm making it clean lined and it's still going to meld with the desert. The home embodies the lifestyle of the empty nest couple with its intelligent yet casual design. So when I say intelligent, you know, they've hired a designer. It's, um, it's thoughtful. We're, we're going to consider all aspects of the space, its function, but we're going to keep the space casual. They wanted it to be lived in and to support their lifestyle. The interior reflects the balance between the organic expression of the Arizona landscape and the modern reimagination of the African bush experience. So I'm combining, I'm, I'm making the suggestion of where I'm getting my concept, that African bush experience of the Ivory Coast and how it's going to be a modern interpretation being here in the desert. The architecture serves to frame the curves of the desert instead of competing with it. So I wanted to kind of frame and celebrate the desert rather than imposing on the desert. So I don't want to create something that's so modern, so contemporary, that it looks like a machine just sitting on the desert. I wanted to help frame and kind of celebrate uh, what's going on with all the mountains and the ditches and the curves and the terrains. The overall design takes it, its cue from Mother Nature to build a residence of the earth with natural materials that complement the desert. The rich blossoms of Palo Verde, that's that tree right there, um, accent the neutral color scheme. So I have a very neutral color scheme, blacks, creams, whites, grays, and browns. And then I, I picked for the color pop, this color of the Palo Verde blossom. The decor is rich yet minimal. Um, lighting is ambient, so there's a lot of this, not just kind of task driven, um, it's ambient. The African design motifs subtly pick up on the safari um, theme. So I'm going to use subtle safari motifs. I'm not going to make it in your face, so you're not going to see zebras and you're not going to see, um, you know, really. Um, I don't know, trendy safari themes, it's going to be more subtle. So I'm looking at things like mud cloths and um, flat woven rugs that would, were indigenous to African design and motifs of the area. Um, and then I'm just going to make those nice and casual. And what I like about it is some of these motifs um, from Africa uh, really do kind of reflect a little bit, kind of hint at um, Native American textiles and patterns as well. So that is my concept statement and that will be your final part of your exercise. So again, taking that programming statement, um, giving a little bit of how, what it's going to look like, and then adding that poetics. So writing is hard. I find it a lot easier just to show some pictures. Writing is a little more hard. Um, if you need help with writing your concept statement, please schedule an appointment with me during my office hours. I, because I know that uh, writing uh, is challenging and we don't get a lot of practice at writing. Uh, this is one of the few times I'm going to ask you to write something in this class, uh, so let's make it good.